Over the last few weeks, we've been working on a series showing European capability, which has been really popular. We started with tanks, GPS, guided rocket launchers and fighter jets, and we then followed up with IFVs, APCs and air defense. And while I promised you guys that I'd do naval capability this week, I'm going to have to disappoint the lovers of seamen until next week. Today, our focus shifts to a rapidly evolving part of modern warfare. Drones, anti-drone technology, electronic warfare and satellite capability. We will explore the cutting-edge technology behind European fixed-wing and FPV drone systems and the state-of-the-art countermeasures being developed to neutralize these emerging threats which has essentially become the main capability on both sides in Ukraine. I'm Tuomas, a retired officer in the Finnish Defense Forces, and today we'll look at how Europe pushes the boundaries of unmanned aerial technology while simultaneously building a robust defense against the same. We're going to start with looking at some of the most combat-proven and effective platforms of fixed-wing surveillance drones from their reputation in Ukraine. European manufacturers have taken significant strides in developing fixed-wing drones that redefine endurance and versatility on the modern battlefield. While some might have wanted me to jump straight to the Eurodrone program here, I'm not going to focus too heavily on platforms that are in the development phase. Drone production has one important asset which many other defense equipment categories lack, low initial cost. This fact means that there's credible and often better alternatives to effective drones delivered from the large companies around Europe. Take this Slovenian-made Sea Astral drone in example. Our contacts in the Ukrainian armed forces always bring up this drone when we discuss this aspect of warfare with them, mainly because of its extreme endurance, low initial cost and loitering capability. It was secretly delivered to Ukraine via many European allies early in the war and has served Ukraine incredibly well since then. The same can be said about the extremely capable Hydron drone from Danish firm Skywatch. It is often part of the aid packages from Germany, the Netherlands, Denmark and other nations. And once again it is a platform which the Ukrainian army has taken to. The makers of Hydron is far ahead of many others when it comes to electronic warfare resistance and it can stay in the air for over three hours. Third on my list will have to be Tekever's vast array of drones. This joint British and Portuguese company has developed fixed wing drones that can stay airborne for 30 hours and it is one of the main suppliers to the British Army. Judging by statements from the British Ministry of Defense, several variants of their drones are already operating in Ukraine. I could potentially go on for an hour and list great European variants for ISR drones there's companies making good alternatives in almost every nation. But as always, we like to talk about combat-proven platforms here. Last but not least, before I move on to Ukraine's immensely successful variants, I'm going to mention a great Dutch variant, which has also been delivered in large quantities to Ukraine via military aid from the Netherlands. Both the Delta Quad Evo and Pro have seen extensive use and have proven reliable, especially for their detailed imaging and have added to the massive stockpile in the Ukrainian armed forces. Making great drones is all about affordable scale, and with Ukraine receiving so many different variants from all over the free world, they've had an edge in experience and battlefield use. While some might argue that this is unfair, Ukraine have taken what they've received, blended it all together, and come up with some surveillance drones that are both affordable in scale and deliver results. Take the Shark Series drones by Ukraspec Systems in example. This factory is churning out hundreds of drones per month, and it will likely be a big export system for Ukraine once the war ends. The creators have a showreel of how many expensive Russian radar and air defense systems their drones have directed artillery fire at. And the last time I heard from them, they estimate that each of the surveillance drones delivered to the armed forces of Ukraine have easily taken out equipment costing more than a thousand times the price of the drones themselves. It is estimated that Ukrainian companies made at least 12,000 fixed-wing surveillance drones internally in Ukraine in 2024, and with such volumes comes an incredible set of data, which dwarfs any other producer of drones on the world stage. These fixed-wing platforms are engineered to fly for several hours, often at high altitudes, while carrying a sophisticated suite of sensors high-resolution cameras, infrared imaging, and advanced communication systems enable these drones to relay real-time data 
back to command centers. Their modular payload configurations mean that operators can rapidly adapt the system for diverse missions, ranging from border surveillance to precision strikes against high-value targets. Now, I know that many of you will likely come at me in the comments about your country's specific drones and companies here. But as I said before, I can't keep going forever. I've showcased six combat-tested platforms which focus on costs and electronic warfare counters. Now, let's move on to a category with the bigger bada boom, as a famous Ukrainian drone officer would say. First-person view kamikaze drones weren't really a big thing until Syrian rebels and Ukrainian innovation pushed it to the forefront of their warfare against Russia and Assad. And since its inception, it's likely become the number one tool in Ukraine's defense locker. Estimates suggest that Ukraine expends at least 200,000 FPV drones per month in the Pokrovsk sector alone. And Ukraine is now using these drones in ways no one really thought possible. First, let's start with a personal favorite of mine, the Svak, a drone that's been developed by Lithuanian company RSA Europe. This drone is at the absolute forefront of non-Ukrainian designs and offers both fiber optic and normal signal controlled FPVs that they can scale up to large quantities. It relies on 3D printing and production can be dispersed to smaller workshops in case of conflict. Again, as with the last video, I risk getting thrown out of Finland for saying this, but the second on my list here will have to be Finnish. The Steel Eagle drone developed in Finland and tested in Ukraine is delivering the goods against superior troop numbers. It's essentially a fragmentation mine that scatters splinters in an area of 50 meters wide, mounted on top of an FPV drone. Ukraine has been utilizing this against so-called meat assaults for the last six months, and the company is working on mass production as we speak. In the FPV scene, there aren't that many credible alternatives outside of Ukraine, apart from the two previous mentions. So I'm going to have to go inside Ukraine again to add more options to the list that aren't loitering drones. You're probably expecting some sleek product video on the Ukrainian FPV scene, but the fact of the matter is that most of the drones doing work in Ukraine are 3D printed variants made locally by a whole bunch of volunteers who dedicate their life to making them. Goida is one such variant, based on a 3D print schematic widely distributed in Ukraine. Other names of different variants are Bavovna and Nordvarta. They're all a testament to the fact that in modern warfare it's not so much about R&D, but more about scale. Perhaps the category in which European companies have come the furthest is what is called loitering munitions. This essentially means a drone which is sent into the air and cycles around conserving energy until its operator finds a target to engage. One notable European variant of this type of drone is the Polish-made Warmate. Early on in the Ukraine war, it was one of the few options at Ukraine's disposal, and since then WB Group has gone from strength to strength and developed their models. Ukraine has utilized this drone to perfection, and word in their drone operator units is that it is one of the go-to kamikaze variants to throw against Russian anti-air capability, radar and expensive equipment due to its relatively sleek, agile design. In this clip, for instance, a warmate takes out a radar system for the S-400 anti-air system worth a staggering 5.5 million euros. That is a good return on the roughly 25,000 euro cost of the warmate. Secondly, French German KNDS has also made a very capable variant called Colibri, which has been present and effective in Ukraine since around April of 2024. The Colibri is made from polystyrene, which makes it extremely lightweight and cheap to make, giving it extended range and room for a larger warhead. Furthermore, there are many other very promising loitering models currently being developed right across Europe. British Overwatch has just released their Folos drone, Rheinmetall is producing the Hero, and many others are joining the race. For all of these, it appears that it is important to get these systems sent to Ukraine for testing, rather than hoping that the market will buy them without proof. Last but not least, Ukraine develops a whole myriad of loitering munition drones and have likely produced the most long-range variants in the world. The drones hitting as far as Murmansk in Russia as well as doing hard work at crippling Russian oil infrastructure, are all in this category. Famous variants include the UJ-25 Skyline, with its 800-kilometer range, the so-called Beaver and Liuti. As drone technology evolves, 
so too does the imperative to develop effective counter-drone systems. European defense industries are heavily invested in crafting innovative solutions to neutralize the threats posed by both fixed-wing and FPV drones. There are many different ways of countering drones. The more old-fashioned approach is to get as much lead into the air as possible by mounting old machine guns on trucks and platforms. This has proven to be a good tactic against Shaheds, but is a lot harder to achieve against smaller and faster drones. A more modern cornerstone of these efforts is the advancement of electronic warfare capabilities. Modern counter-drone systems are designed to jam or disrupt the communication and navigation signals that drones rely on. By targeting the data links that control these unmanned systems, electronic jamming can force a drone off course or compel it to return to base, effectively neutralizing its operational potential. Researchers are also developing sophisticated algorithms to isolate and identify drone signals amidst the clutter of the electromagnetic spectrum, ensuring a rapid and accurate response. At the forefront of this technology is Italian ELT Group. They deliver electronic warfare systems to fighter jets, helicopters and ground crews. They're also developing the electronic warfare suite for the upcoming sixth generation Tempest program. The whole idea behind their system is to use scramblers to confuse incoming ordnance, drones and so forth and the focus these days is very much on anti-drone technology. Sweden Saab is also at the forefront of electronic warfare systems. Their serious system couples extremely capable sensors with radar, which can easily locate the operators of drones. With this kind of equipment, you can detect where a drone operator is hiding and target that location. It is unclear whether or not this system is already operating in Ukraine but I suspect that Sweden has sent much more of its highly advanced electronic systems than they disclose. When it comes to more portable variants of electronic warfare, anti-drone guns are at the tip of the spear. Both Ukraine's Kvertus and Lithuania's NT service have produced rifles that work really well against FPV drones. These two variants are dominating the field in Ukraine and are often coupled with a drone spotter who follow drones back to their base once the signal is lost. This way Ukraine can effectively target Russian drone operators. When it comes to more traditional ways of shooting down drones, there are several modern alternatives. Germany's Rheinmetall in example produces the Skynex system, which incorporates airburst ammunition which detonates close to drones. These turrets can be mounted on trucks or placed strategically around the battlefield and they operate in conjunction with one another. Similarly, Britain and Sweden's BA systems have rejuvenated the old Bofors anti-air gun and evolved it into a similar system to that seen from Rheinmetall. The Triton Mark II follows on in the footsteps of its imposing Bofors gun and offers extreme mobility on its relatively light truck. It uses AI for targeting and is able to clear a whole area of airborne objects within seconds. Poland also deserves a mention here for their network-centric Pilika system which combines both missile and kinetic weapons to form entire rings of anti-drone coverage. This system is fairly new, but it also appears to counter many of the downfalls of the aforementioned systems, mainly due to the fact that it can also target missiles and jets with its Piorun batteries. Another promising area of research is the development of high-energy directed countermeasures, most notably laser-based systems. Though still largely experimental, these directed energy weapons have the potential to disable drones mid-flight with pinpoint accuracy. Rather than relying on traditional guns or missiles, these systems employ concentrated energy beams to damage critical components, offering a method to neutralize threats with minimal collateral damage. Perhaps the country in the world who are the furthest ahead on this is the British, and they claim they can shoot down a drone with their Dragonfire system at the cost of only 10 pounds per shot. Britain have allegedly already given this system to Ukraine for trials, and while it's covered in secrecy, the noises coming from Ukraine are promising. The last category I'll mention is the kind of large autonomous drones, which serve as high-altitude reconnaissance and missile craft, akin to the American Reaper. Perhaps the country in the European part of NATO, who have come the furthest with this, is the Turkish Baykar technology. You may remember those videos from early on in the Ukraine war, where the TB2 was taking apart Russian convoy after Russian convoy, 
However, there's also other European projects focusing on this kind of drone. Furthest along is another drone from Baykar, namely Kizil Elma, which Turkey has developed alongside Ukraine. It is shaped like a jet and is faster, stealthier and deadlier than Baykar's previous drones. Turkey has developed into a drone powerhouse, mainly due to being embargoed by the US, and shows to everyone else in Europe what is possible if you have to focus on your own product. Not only does this project seem very promising, but it is done at the fraction of the cost of similar American drone programs, and it only contains either Turkish or European parts, and is set to be able to land and take off from smaller naval vessels. Airbus, Dassault and Leonardo is also working closely on a similar combat drone, named Eurodrone, which is a pan-European project involving Germany, Italy, Spain and France. It is this kind of project that Europe will need to start focusing on now that America is showing that it's entirely unreliable as a partner to Europe by threatening both Canada and Denmark with military force. Lastly, British-Swedish BAE have worked on their own combat and surveillance drone named Taranis for the better part of 10 years. While this program looked promising, there's been very little information on it for about five years. Some parts used in this drone have made their way into the FCAS sixth generation fighter jet program, so it is likely still active to some extent. Hopefully a resurgent focus on defense spending in the UK will mean that they get some oxygen back into this program. So, what does all this mean for the future of European defense? The dual evolution of advanced drone systems and their countermeasures signals a major strategic shift for Europe. While European NATO allies used to rely on American drones, it appears that Trump has abruptly ended this and pushed many nations into their own paths. As with other European weapons programs, I think it's time for more of these nations to start working together, as we really do not need 20 different models of surveillance and FPV drones. The good thing about the amount of variants seems to be that Europe has more than the required capability and know how to be fully independent in the drone department. And as Turkey has shown, it really does not need to come with the extravagant costs seen in American projects. Furthermore, with Trump and his team cutting ties with Europe by essentially declaring that they won't come to our aid, we need to back up Ukraine in our own ways. While this will cost initially, it will also come with the extreme skill and know-how of the Ukrainian drone programs. If we stand up for Ukraine now, we can develop partnerships with Ukraine which will take our drone programs to the next level, not only in the hardware department but in the actual operation of drones on a battlefield too. If the US doesn't want to be there, we're more than capable of building our armies with our own military gear without injecting hundreds of billions per year into the American economy. Next week we'll look at naval platforms, so stick around. And if you enjoyed this video, it would be an honor if you gave it a like. Have a great weekend everyone and stay safe.